glory and honour to God. And Wow, you know what brings us together? The blood of Jesus. What brings us together is the Holy Spirit. What brings us together is the common faith of the rich legacy of scriptures. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Many years prior to that, 1,500 years, the ancient Israelites took a lamb, a year old, without blemish. And on the Passover night, they slayed the lamb, they cooked it and ate the roast lamb with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. And it symbolised the, 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 the angel passing over the blood on the doorpost and saving them from certain death on that particular night. And so 2,000 years ago, Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And what brings us together at a very point of baptism, there's two ordinances that Jesus commanded. Baptism and participation of the Lord proclaiming, do this in remembrance of me, says Jesus. Not the Hebrew Passover, the Christ Passover or the Lord's Supper. Now, I don't have the scriptures on the screen this today, but if you turn to Luke chapter 22, and we'll be essentially staying within the gospel accounts. Luke chapter 22, verse 16, Jesus then links his desire to eat this Passover with what he's going to set in the terms of the new covenant. I tell you, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So what Jesus initiated 2,000 years ago, he now links it to what we understand is the marriage supper of the Lamb. When the bride, the body of Christ, and Jesus become one. In Luke chapter 22, verse 17, and so he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he says, take this and divide it among yourselves, for I'll tell you from now on, and now again, he links what the bread, and he links the fruit of the vine to, that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God comes. We're going to explore the Lord's Supper today because on April the 14th, when we come together, as Paul admonished those in Corinth, that we do so in a worthy manner, to discern the Lord's body. And those of us who are baptised are compelled by the Holy Spirit to participate as Jesus initiated in community. And many times there's a lot of baptisms prior to this event because there's a lot of people who feel by the Holy Spirit, I need to be there. This is my time has come. It's very powerful. Now, going back over history, the Passover lamb was killed once a year on the, the 14th day of the Nisan, the Hebrew calendar, and was held annually. It was a part of the annual appointed times of the Lord. And the appointed times of the Lord have a distinct Christological narrative. The ancient Israelites tied it in with their deliverance from Egypt, essentially. But the Christological, when John the Baptist introduces us to Jesus, the first thing he says is ties Jesus to the Passover lamb. He says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the book of Revelation says, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. So the appointed times of the Lord, beginning with the Hebrew Passover, is a narrative that you look... It's all about salvation, it's all about Jesus, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's very powerful. So that evening, Jesus tells his disciples to go and prepare the Passover that he may eat with them. And so Jesus does that. And so it's the last Hebrew Passover. He has the Passover cedar. He has the roast leg. What do the disciples prepare? They prepared the roast lamb, the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread. And so he did that. And then at the end of the Passover meal, then Jesus initiates the symbols of the new covenant. And so Jesus takes bread to begin with. And do you know in John chapter 6, verse 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Do you remember those words in John chapter 6? Jesus says in verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. So he's about to break the bread, bless the bread, break it. But remember earlier, prior to this, when Jesus was teaching his disciples, he said, if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that he was speaking of was his broken body. If you participate in the body of Christ, 
And we know that bread, there's no such thing as transubstantiation. It's a symbol, it's a metaphor. But we come before God and participate in this symbol because you eat, whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give for the world, says Jesus, is my flesh. Now, this became apparent as you read later on in the Gospel accounts. John remembers it prior to it. And John takes us a selection of just a few weeks of Jesus' life and chooses his words carefully. In John chapter 6, going back to verse 35, Jesus says to them again, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now this whole concept of hungering and thirsting, Jesus chose to initiate the greatest covenant on earth at a very basic human gathering, a meal. He chose bread and the fruit of the vine to signify the greatest covenant that could ever exist. And he addresses the issue of our hunger and thirst. I was only talking to somebody this morning that a lot of people are hungering and thirsting to be fulfilled. So they fill their early lives up with entertainment, activity, busyness, sports. But those things don't deliver the deep hole in our heart. And eventually we get to a point in our lives, whether it's 35 or 55 or 75, we recognise, oh Lord, I surrender all. Your call has been there along and I've, just, and I've seen it the last couple of years. So many people have come to faith because the other things in life that we might have pursued did not meet our criteria that we were really looking for. And so Jesus says on the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles, speaking of the Holy Spirit, this idea of hunger and thirst, he said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And then John explains about the Holy Spirit which was not yet given. That came on the day of Pentecost, another appointed time of the Lord. And so then we come with the bread, the cup, and then Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And many people from different Christian denominations have different practices. And because of that, there are various questions in the last year that I've had. For example, do you wash feet? Somebody who's been sharing fellowship with us for quite some time, said to me, you know, when I first washed feet, I was very unnervous about it. it just not, I came from an evangelical background, and it, wow, he said, it had a lot of meaning. And so I want to explore that. Now, two questions I hope to answer as we explore this subject is why do we commemorate and proclaim the Lord's death annually? We can do it weekly, why not? <coughs> and why do we wash feet? As a boy, a young man contemplating baptism, I had no problem with the broken bread and I had no problem with the fruit of the vine. But foot washing is something that our society doesn't do. <coughs> Societies of past offered great hospitality. You would meet for meal and the lowest servant would wash your feet. It's been known right through the Semitic peoples and it was right that, in that first time and that Lord's Supper, we know what happened. And so... The Lord's Supper is a memorial and a remembrance and a proclamation. And what we have within the body of Christ is we recognise that there are some appointed times that bring us into fellowship. One of them is the weekly Sabbath. The weekly Sabbath is an appointed time that all of us will not take shortcuts on. You'll say no to serve our work but you'll say yes to good work, acts of charity. You'll say no to sport. Why? Because God is sovereign. You'll say you'll travel great distances just to be there because you put God first. That's the only thing that you want to be, the appointed times of the Lord. <coughs> and you see this in the first century. Some Christians use the fact that the disciples were gathered on a Sunday morning on the day of Pentecost as an indication that the church was now migrating to Sunday worship. No, from the Sabbath, Pentecost means count 50. 50 days from the, the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread. And the disciples on that Sunday morning had counted 50 to that day of Pentecost and they were gathered together. And what happened on that day? At the appointed time the Holy Spirit came. So when Paul talks to those Gentile converts, he introduces them to the con concept of an appointed time. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's, let's open that because that might help us on this journey. And I encourage anybody who's got more questions after we explore this 
to, let's talk about it later. Let's, let's, let's raise these questions. Um, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Now remember, these weren't Jewish converts. These were Gentile converts living in the, city of, the Greek city of Corinth. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that, on, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. So Paul links it to a particular night on the calendar when Jesus took bread. And now, I want to, because we, can, we, we will expand on that in a moment. And when he'd given thanks, now remember Paul is talking to Gentile converts, in verse 24, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you, do this for remembrance of me. And we read that and we do this exactly according to scripture. Paul says in verse 25 to those Gentiles, in the same way he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance to you. So Paul singled out this particular moment, appointed time, when Jesus took bread, wine, the fruit of the vine, as a time of significance. Now, if we read on in verse 26, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the proclamation until Jesus comes. Now, you notice he says, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. Now, the narrative of Paul's here is somewhat ambiguous because I have faithful brothers and sisters who participate in the cup and the bread every Sunday morning or every Saturday morning. And the essential thing here is that this memorial is participated in. It's commanded until Jesus comes. Now in our tradition, we strive as much as we can to mirror first century understanding, whether it was the day of Pentecost or Paul planning his journey around Pentecost or unleavened bread or tabernacles, we know that what Paul is referring to is a day calculated not by the Roman calendar but by the Hebrew calendar. And so one of the things I want to stress here is that as a community of believers, as a part of the body of Christ, we give grace to those who celebrate it and proclaim it, let's say on a weekly basis. But I make the caveat, I was talking with one of my Church of Christ friends. He's a pastor, been a pastor for 40 years. And he says, you know, there is merit for, for celebrating it not every week, maybe once every three months, or maybe as you do, once a year. He said, if it's celebrated and proclaimed less often, it carries with it more meaning. And that's one of the reasons why we do it once a year is because like any other covenant, Rebecca and I celebrate our wedding anniversary covenant once a year. Now we love each other every other day of the year, but the idea we take time out. Now there are a lot of people who forget their wedding anniversary, but covenant is a prevailing theme right through scripture. And God says, I will remember my covenant. And whether, whether the Romans 14 principle comes into here, I'm not entering into that into this conversation. I'm talking about that the annual cycle of commemoration and proclamation is held very dear within our community. And as a result, we want to make it work. So that once a year, when we gather together, brothers and sisters, let's that's why it's now end of January and we're beginning a series of messages on the life covenant of Jesus through his blood so that on the April the 14th when we come together we discern the Lord's body very carefully. Now those in Corinth were still very new. There was a rowdy gathering on that night and some of them got drunk and some of them were, well anyway, there was another, another story. Paul had a lot of work to work through Gentile converts. You know, I was thinking about baptism. We get baptised once. I would like to get baptised every year, but no, that once I die and once I'm resurrected to glory. The symbolism there is that we must remember our baptismal cosmic covenant. Jesus died for us and we participate in his death. If the pastor or the presiding elder held us under, under the water any longer, <laughs> we would die. 
that we've brought out of the symbolic grave and we're still not yet complete with the laying on of hands we receive the Holy Spirit, the personal presence of the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to live with us forever. And so you and I live our lives every day of the week proclaiming Jesus. How many times did you talk to other people, strangers in the street, people you meet in the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm doing it more now. I met a lady the very first time and as I was leaving her house, I said, thank you very much and God bless you. Oh, that slipped out. She said, I'm a Christian as well. Glory to God. I didn't know. I just was, I, I experienced her love and fellowship. And I thought, oh, this is really lovely. Because sometimes when you go to a stranger's house, you don't know what you're going to meet. You know, I walked into a person's house who was grumpy, who had five dogs sleeping on the couch. And I went, you, know, you don't know where people are at in their lives. Anyway, brothers and sisters, Jesus has tied in the Lord's Supper with a marriage supper of the Lamb we read about in the book of Revelation. And, wow, that's powerful. And I hope as we come in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're in his presence now. We two or three are gathered in my name, says Jesus. There I am among them. So we're in the pre Jesus' presence, but we are in the presence of covenant proclamation. No greater love is this, says Jesus, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, says Jesus, if you do what I command you. And baptism is a command and the Lord's Supper is a command. Now I want to make the point that we do not celebrate or proclaim the Hebrew Passover. The Passover lamb and the bitter herbs were part of another covenant. It was the blood on the doorposts. But the Lamb of God symbolised in the Hebrew Passover points none other than to Jesus Christ. But we're not under the old covenant. We recognise it's all under a new covenant and it's the covenant that Jesus initiated. So how does that new covenant celebration, proclamation and remembrance look like? It's done with bread, unleavened bread. The only carryover from the Hebrew Passover because that's what they ate at the Hebrew Passover as well. The fruit of the vine and foot washing. And I want to go through the Gospels now and pick a bit from Luke and pick a bit from John and from Matthew and Mark and we'll flip through some pages to get an idea of what this looks like. Let's go back to Luke chapter 22. When the hour had come, you remember many times the Bible says his hour had not yet come? But now Jesus' hour has come. The purpose for which he was born into this world at 33 and a half years of age, now his hour has come. Luke chapter 22 verse 14 when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And in verse 16, for I tell you, I will not eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus links this Passover, this Christ Passover, this covenant making with the kingdom of God. Now let's, take, let's turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark, we believe, was the earliest gospel written. Mark was, was Peter's disciple and he was later on with Paul as well and Barnabas. Then he links Mark chapter 14 verse 22 and as they were eating he took bread and after blessing it he broke it and gave to them and said, take, eat, and this is my body. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a little bit of a piece of flat of unleavened bread and we're going to pray over it and we're going to break the bread and we're going to share that little piece of bread as a symbol of Jesus' body. Take it. This is a command of Jesus. In verse 23, And he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. So Jesus initiated this in community. Now, if you live 500 miles away, many people celebrate this in the privacy of their own home. Rightly so. They cannot travel 500 miles. But if you live within at least striking distance, we, it's best to do this in community, just as Jesus did it with his disciples. Verse 24, and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And little did they realise the powerful symbolism of what that would mean a few hours later. Truly I say to you, in verse 25, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And remember when Jesus prayed, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And one of the first acts on the sovereign Jesus will gather us all together for the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Luke tells us, let's jump back to Luke chapter 22. We're going to jump between the gospel counts here because it paints a picture. And he took the bread in verse 19. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now you and I remember Jesus all the time. But it's with particular solemnity that we remember what he did for us. He paid the price of our sin as the Lamb of God. In verse 20, exactly the same in similar words to what Mark wrote. And likewise the cup after they'd eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And if you want to know what the new covenant looks like as opposed to the old covenant, read Hebrews chapters 7, 8, 9 and 10. And then you see the faith chapter in chapter 11. Hebrews is good at bad talking about what the new covenant looks like. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew was a tax collector. We believe that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew, though we don't have an early century Hebrew manuscript. We have a Greek copy of it. Matthew was good with numbers. Matthew wrote a, a good long account of Jesus including his genealogy. Matthew 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take eat. This is my body. Remember, we're getting eyewitness accounts of those who were there, and those who were in the first century, who decided to tell us what's most important. And he took a cup in verse 27, and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So we have a little bit more in Matthew's account. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Again, that sense of community over a table. Very beautiful. Now we're going to turn to John chapter 17. John chapter 13. Remember the story of the narrative where Jesus, after the supper... Let's begin John chapter 13, verse 3. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. He rose from supper. He laid aside his garments. He took a towel. He tied it around his waist, very deliberate. Then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet. And you read in the next few verses where Peter is absolutely shocked. There's his teacher and Lord washing his, their feet. And Peter says, you'll never wash my feet. This was a job for the lowest of servants. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, Peter, you have nothing to do with me. Whoa. Whoa. Then let's drop down to verse 12. And when he'd washed their feet, he put on his outer garments and resumed his place. And he said, do you understand what I've done for you? The very fact that he asked that question was they were like, wow. Wow. (laughs) This wasn't planned for. He says, you call me teacher and Lord. A few weeks ago we talked about the scripture where you you, you recognise that Jesus was a rabbi, a teacher. But now Jesus also uses the word Lord because you know that I've come from the Father. I am the Lord. And you are right for us, I am. If I then... Now Jesus doesn't use the word teacher and Lord now. He puts the word Lord first. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I've done for you. And as a young man growing up, I think, oh no, I don't want to show anybody my feet. A a good manicure doesn't help it a great deal. And I haven't, I I live in boots all my life, no suntan. But all of a sudden, I came to the point when I realised my friend who's washing my feet is an image bearer of Jesus. And that's like Jesus washing my feet. And then I had to get down and get a towel and a bowl of water and I wash his feet. And. He has Jesus in him and I'm washing Jesus' feet. And as somebody said to me recently, John, this is really humbling. It's not about you and me, it's about Jesus. And he commands it to us. 
In verse 16, he reminds us, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So what does the Lord's Supper look like? Well, Jesus gave some fairly clear indications. Now, different traditions place the foot washing either at the beginning of the Lord's Supper or at the end of the Lord's Supper. And I've talked to Phil about that over the years because different people have different preconceived ideas. But here in John's reading, he rose from supper. And somebody said to me, John, the very first act that you proceed from the presence of Jesus after participating in his body and his broken blood, his spilled blood, is the life of a servant, just like Jesus. And your first act is one of humility and service. I went, wow. Very powerful. Brothers and sisters, these are commandments of Jesus under the terms of the new covenant. Not only did Jesus demonstrate brotherly love, but agape love, divine love. And you and I are loved, extraordinary love. And so we participate in something that's not only symbolic, but powerfully practical as an outward expression as I am a servant as much as I am a son and an heir of the grace of life. And covenant means a lot to me. Physical human marriage is a divine institution, a natural union. But what we share with Jesus, physical marriage is is just a shadow of the eternity of I in you and you in me. And we as a part of the Church of God Seventh Day really want to as, as much as we can is live by the Holy Scriptures, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, we are careful about tradition. There's nothing wrong with tradition. But tradition over history can sometimes have nuances and shades of grey that can mess us around. And so we look to be careful of tradition. See, tradition within evangelical and broader Christianity says that Jesus was crucified on a Friday afternoon and resurrected on a Sunday morning, and so you have roughly three parts of three days. But Jesus said that the only sign was a sign of Jonah who was in the belly of the great whale three days and three nights. And you look at the account of John and the apostles, Jesus was, had the Lord's Supper on a Tuesday. He was crucified on a Wednesday. Thursday was the high day of unleavened bread. So they took down his body before then. Thursday, Friday was preparation for the weekly Sabbath. Saturday was the Sabbath. The high priest cut the, the first of the barley and the wave sheaf offering right on sunset or thereafter on the Saturday night. And when Mary got to the tomb on Sunday morning, Jesus was gone. So from Wednesday night to Saturday night is three days and three nights. Tradition is okay. But most of Christianity's tradition on this one is theologically and historically wrong. So we want to, as a part of the body of Christ, be a part of the pioneering revival and reformation to say this is what the scripture says. Let's be true to it as much as we can. The only official sign that Jesus would give that he was the Messiah was three days and three nights in the grave. And you and I celebrate that victory when we are lifted out of the waters of baptism. And we go, Amen and Hallelujah. So every year we participate in that covenant meal, proclaiming Jesus until he comes. And we live under the new covenant and we proclaim his death and we celebrate his resurrection. Turn to 1 John. John, many years later, writes a pastoral epistle one of three epistles, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. He says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And then he says, And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So if you've carried heavy burdens, not only rejection that we talked about earlier, but the heavy burden of sin, you lay it down at the foot of Jesus and never pick it back up again. And don't ever listen to the devil who'll say, oh, by the way, you did this in your former life and you can know that you've laid it down at the foot of the cross. And Jesus borne that sin. And so that's what we proclaim. John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Apostle Paul talked about the struggle of the old man of sin clinging to his back, dying a slow death. 
if we confess our sins, He is faithful, He is just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, brothers and sisters, it's an ongoing process from day to day and from year to year. And so, brothers and sisters, if we are baptised, I encourage you all the more now to begin in prayer, in praise and petition, to come before God and say, Father, forgive me of my sins because I've slipped up again this year. I've fallen short of your grace. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just because that's the power of Jesus' blood. And that's the height of it. Now, if you're not baptised, and I'm speaking to brothers and sisters in this great, well, I don't know how many hundreds of people are watching today through live streaming. And if you're thinking about it, what are you waiting for? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he was in the grave for three days and three nights? Have you repented of your sins or would you like to repent of your sins? Have you accepted Jesus as Saviour? And have you counted the cost? These are things we talk about in the hours or the days leading up to baptism. Brothers and sisters, if you're in New South Wales or Victoria, I'll be there next month in early March. Ring me. Let's sit down and have a coffee. Let's talk about how close you are to the waters of baptism. Because the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, the Father draws all people to Jesus. And how powerful is that? And those of us who are already baptised, who have already crossed the Jordan, so to speak, are we growing continually from day to day and year to year? in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour? Are we filled with the Holy Spirit so we're never thirsty? Do we eat of the bread of life, Jesus who sustains us? Are we filled with joy? Are we filled with faith and courage? Are we about the Lord's will and work? Or do we allow the cares of the world to pull us aside? You know, I'm reading a book, Don't Let the Enemy Sit at Your Table. That's very powerful. Because we'll be coming before the Lord's table, the bread, the fruit of the vine. And the devil has no place at that table. And the book that I'm reading is, a, is really don't let the devil into your thoughts. Don't let him into your house. Watch your, your conversation. Watch your conduct. Because brothers and sisters, we are image bearers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we come together, the Father is well pleased. And we again, for another year, for another day, proclaim the Lord Jesus until he comes. And we go, Alleluia and Amen. And we have great peace in the Lord.